Hello. This is the first of what's going to probably be a pair of lectures, which are going to be a little more theoretical than we usually are. We, in the week nine lectures, we saw a lot of algorithms for computing with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And now we're going to prove some theorems about what happens when we do those computations. So let's set up our notation. Let A be an n by n square matrix. Let V1 through VK be eigenvectors of A. And to be careful about to be non-zero. We have eigenvalues, lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda k. And we saw before that if w is in the span of the, of the eigenvectors, then we had a simple formula for a to the nw. And here it is. If w is a linear combination of the eigenvectors like this, then here's that a to the nw is a similar linear combination, but with nth powers of the eigenvalues stuck into each slot. So it's useful to be able to take some general vector w and express it as a linear combination of eigenvectors. And we know that when it comes to expressing some vector as a linear combination of some other vectors, the best situation is that the vectors you're trying to express in terms of are be a basis. If you have a basis, for Rn, then every vector at Rn is expressible at that basis in a unique way. So life would be good if A had a basis of eigenvectors. And we call a basis of eigenvectors an eigenbasis. So what I want to talk about today is the question of whether this list of eigenvectors might be an eigenbasis. And remember, for something to be a basis, we need two things. We need it to be linearly independent, and we need it to span. And today we're going to be talking about this first issue. We're going to be talking about are these eigenvectors linearly independent? And here is the theorem which is going to answer that. Suppose that yeah, we have a square matrix and suppose we have some list of eigenvectors, no two of which are equal. And for each one of those, sorry, we have a list of eigenvalues, no two of which are equal. And for each of those eigenvalues, we have some non-zero eigenvector. Then those vectors are linearly independent. So this is saying, as long as we have different eigenvalues, the eigenvectors we have will automatically be independent. Let's, do, let's see how we prove it. So first of all, let's see why this works when k is 2, when we have two eigenvalues and two eigenvectors. So remember, say that two vectors are linearly independent is just to say that they are both non-zero and they're not proportional to each other. And we already assumed they're non-zero, so let's see why they can't be proportional. Well, if they were proportional, then on the one hand, and multiplication by A would stretch by a factor of lambda one on that line, and also multiplication by A would stretch by a factor of lambda two we'd be asking for multiplication by A to stretch by both the factor lambda one and the factor lambda two on the same line. Or to say a little bit more algebraically, we'd have AV2 is ACV1. You can pull up the scale of C, so that's CAV1, which is C lambda one V1, since V1 is an eigenvector. Also AV2 is lambda two V2, since V2 is an eigenvector. This tells us that lambda one should equal lambda two, but lambda one and lambda two are distinct, so that's not going to work. Okay, so that's arguing that this doesn't happen for k equals two. And now let's see that this also doesn't happen in general. As you might guess, the proof is going to be by induction. So what we're going to imagine is that we have already shown that the first k minus one vectors are linearly independent. And we're going to show that if we know that these are linearly independent, then this last vector, that adding this last vector to the list doesn't change that. So if we have k minus one linearly independent vectors and we add one more, one of two things are going to happen. Either we're still going to be linearly independent 
or the new guy is going to be a linear combination of the old guys. So suppose for the sake of contradiction that VK is redundant, meaning VK is a linear combination of V1 through VK minus one. Okay, this is a long computation, but nothing deep is happening. I'm going to take this equation here and multiply it on the left by A and see what happens. So AVK is A times the linear combination. We use the linearity, we, we distribute this product. So you have C1 AV1 plus C2 AV2, etc. And V1 is supposed to be an eigenvector. So AV1 is lambda 1 V1, AV2 is lambda 2 V2, etc. Now, on the other hand, VK is supposed to be an eigenvector also. We have to use that. So AVK is lambda KVK is lambda K times this whole thing, which we assumed equal to VK. Distributing that out, we get this expression. So uh, the thing over here, that's on the left-hand side, is equal to the thing over here on the right-hand is equal to, uh, is equal to, oh well, this thing over here on the right-hand side and subtracting them from each other, we obtain this formula at the bottom of the page. Okay, so this dot, dot, dot is all the computations that were on the previous slide. I've hidden them away now. The point is here was the formula that was at the bottom of the previous slide. But we assumed our assumption of the induction is that we already knew that the first K minus one eigenvectors were really independent. So this means that yet all the coefficients in front of them must be zero. C1 lambda one minus lambda K, C2 lambda two minus lambda K, all of these guys must be zero. And all the lambd lambdas are different. So these lambda one minus lambda K factors, they're non-zero. And that means all the C's are zero. And that's what you try to prove when you're proving with your independence. So, uh, so then the C's are zero, so VK is zero, and we said we wanted the V's to be non-zero eigenvectors. Okay, so that concludes our proof. Um, you definitely might want to watch it and think about it a few times. You have complete permission to pause and rewind, but I'm going to move forward. So we've now shown we have a really nice answer to our first question. The V's are linearly independent if all the eigenvalues are distinct, if every pair of them is different. The other thing you might wonder is, now the other question about bases is, do the eigenvectors span Rn? Well, if the characteristic polynomial has n distinct roots, then the answer is definitely yes, because then we're going to get n eigenvectors, one for each of those roots, and, and since all the lambdas are different, our answer to one will, well, sorry, let's well, say this again. If the characteristic polynomial has n distinct roots, the answer is definitely yes, because every one of those roots is going to give us some eigenvector. And since the roots are distinct, those n eigenvectors are going to be linearly independent, and n linearly independent vectors are going to be a basis. OK, to discuss what happens when we don't have n distinct roots, then we need to talk about geometric multiplicity and algebraic multiplicity. And that's where we'll pick up in the next lecture.